Good evening. My name is Jim Mathis. I am the uh, former Bishop of San Diego, uh, which is the other Holy Land. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm a, a pilgrim here as Associate Dean of Students and Director of the Anglican Studies Program at Virginia Theological Seminary. And on behalf of our Dean, Ian Markham, who could not be with us tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event the challenges for Christians in the Holy Land today. We welcome all of you who are here tonight in this assembly and also to those joining us online via the live stream. This is the signature lecture in the, our Center of Anglican Communion Studies year-long focus on the Anglican Communion in the Middle East. It is therefore my great pleasure and honor to welcome the Most Reverend Suhail Diwani, Archbishop of the Diocese of Jerusalem and the Middle East. Bishop Diwani was consecrated as Bishop Coadjutor of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem in January of 2006 and was installed as diocesan and the 14th Anglican Bishop in Jerusalem on April 15, 2007, what we in the United States were when we were paying our taxes, you were installed. As diocesan bishop, Bishop Archbishop Duani is the chief pastor of 27 parishes spread through five political regions of Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. As bishop, he is also chairman of the board of more than 30 institutions of education and healthcare spread throughout the diocese. In May of 2017, he was elected as President Bishop Primate of the Anglican Episcopal Province of Jerusalem in the Middle East. In a multicultural, multi faith, multi ethnic diocese, Archbishop Duani is a strong advocate for peace and reconciliation. And for our purposes tonight, it is worth underscoring that he is a graduate of this institution, Virginia Theological Seminary, receiving a Master's of Arts in Theology in 1986. And so it is an absolute pleasure to welcome him back to his second home and campus here. So help me welcome Archbishop Duani. Good evening, dear brothers and sisters. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and our Redeemer. I pray that academic year 2018-2019, its theme of the communion in the Middle East will be a time of prayer, reflection, fellowship, and engagement. I want to begin by thanking the director of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies, Dr. Robert Heaney, for his kind invitation to join you at the launch of this year's project. I want also to thank the Dean and Faculty of Virginia Theological Seminary for their continuous support. I know that eight of my clergy were a graduate of this seminary. We very much appreciate your friendship and regard partnership with you as in instrumental to our ministry of the gospel. We are encouraged by one another's faith and mission. The Anglican communion in the Middle East, hence for the communion, covers a, a, a vast geographic area. The Jerusalem bishopric was founded in 1841, and the first Anglican bishop arriving in, uh, in the country, he was of Jewish origin. 
Michael Alexander Solomon was the first bishop. I think it was on purpose to send somebody of Jewish background in order to do some evangelism among the Jewish community, small Jewish community who, who were there in Palestine. But I, I, be, I believe that, I don't know how much successful was his mission, but uh, he turned to the Christians who were there. And my family is one of the families that uh, welcomed the Anglican tradition at that time. So I am consider myself to be a fourth Anglican, uh, the fourth uh, Anglican generation you know, since 1841. The constructing of the Archbishopric in 1976 created the province of Jerusalem in the Middle East. The province includes four dioceses, the Diocese of Jerusalem and the Middle East, which covers Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon, of course, Syria and Lebanon. The Diocese of Egypt covering North Africa and the Horn of Africa. The Diocese of Cyprus and the Gulf and the diocese of Iran. As a primate of the province, my leadership, along with that of my colleagues bishops, extends to all these places. Anglicanism in the Middle East arrived in the beginning of the 19th century by missionaries from Britain who sought to spread the gospel to the Holy Land and later to other parts of the Middle East. Well, I have to mention here that uh, before welcoming the Anglican tradition in 1841, we belonged to the Eastern churches. What I want to say is that we've been Christians in that land since the Pentecost. So we call ourselves the indigenous Christians of the Holy Land. And, uh, and I, will say, uh, I will mention later the challenges that we face as Christian community. The missionaries began their work by ministering to what they believed to be the urgent spiritual and material needs of the local Christians and community. They encountered people overwhelmed by poverty and illness, for the most part illiterate. They responded to these needs by establishing medical centers, schools, centers, for the mentally and physically challenged, homes for the elderly, and guest houses to provide hospitality to pilgrims. Well, it's good to mention that when the missionaries came to the country, first they start opening schools, then after that they opened churches. So they started with education. Anglican spirituality, liturgy, mission, and theology attracted people to these institutions, with the result that the Anglican community were established. What makes the Anglican communion in the Middle East unique is the rich diversity of its cultures and its capacity to operate in wide-ranging ethnic, national, cultural, and religious contexts. Anglicans, as you know, cherish the richness of difference and strive to practice unity and diversity. While the cultural richness of the communion is very evident, even more so in the solidar solidarity and accord among members, dioceses, clergy, and communities. Anglican communities in the Middle East consist of both native adherents to the Anglican tradition, and expatriates located in the Middle East for who, those who, who come to the Middle East for work or mission. These communities faithfully enact the gospel of Christ in the most difficult circumstances. Their ministry witnesses to the love of God in Jesus Christ in a very troubled region. In the Middle East, the communion must not only respond to the needs of, the, of its membership, but also try to, advise, to advance the common good of the larger community. Being committed to God's mission in the world, the communion believes in God's alternatives 
to dominant unjust social, economic, and political structures. We believe we are called to serve God's people. All God's people, as all humans, are created in God's image and likeness. As you all know that in the, in the land of the Holy One, there are two peoples and three religions together. The word of God, uh, if we talk about religion there and, uh, and uh, the challenges that we face, we believe very strongly that the word of God should be above every human conflict. It cannot foster a conflict between peoples or individuals. On the contrary, the message of salvation is to be found in it, even in our present situation of conflict. The Bible is a word of God, a word of justice and forgiveness directed to the two peoples and the three religions. When religion is set free from politics or social uh, confinement, it will be a force for liberation, but subject to social or political constraints, it loses liberation power. Religions should help us correct ourselves to free us in order to be able to dialogue with others in a common action of reconciliation and construction. The Bible is an ins ins inseparable part of our faith as it is of our culture, religion, and heritage. Sharing and the building of peace and justice in the land of the Bible is certainly a good work. Therefore, we must share in the building of more fraternal society, founded on dignity and mutual recognition of rights and responsibilities for everyone and every people in the same country of the Bible. To read and to live the Bible today in the land of the Bible is a grace and challenge. It is a grace because we journey daily with the same Jesus along the same roads where he walked with his disciples as companion and friend. It is a challenge because we must experience today in the same land of conflict and sufferings enters our own conversation with the same Lord in order to make our own hearts burn within us. I would like to describe our ministry in the communities as having three main goals, or we have three concepts. First, the communion strives to be a model missionary church, proclaiming the mighty acts of the one who called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Mission is very dear to Anglicans. It constitutes a very nature of our ministry. Our ministry takes part in the messianic project, the inbreaking of divine reign embodied in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the commissioning of the church to transform the world, we believe that we are called by God to present, enact new, enact new possibilities. We provide hope in the midst of hopelessness. We practice love in a context infused with hatred. We advocate neighborliness in a region full of intolerance. We provide care to victims of injustice. Our mission incorporates restoring human dignity, inspiring reconciliation, and constructing hope for those who live in despair. We recognize that our mission requires confronting injustice, bringing about healing, inspiring communities 
and repair, repairing our world. We recognize that our mission is not stress-free, yet we hope it will be liberating to us as well as to those around us. It requires facing challenges, confronting the status quo, and initiating new possibilities. Well, if I want to mention about the Christian presence in, in, uh, in the land of the Holy One, according to the statistics, in 1947, the, uh, the Christian presence were around 27% of the total population. Now, in 2019, we are less than 1% of the total population. Uh, according to the statistics, in, uh, in uh, 1947, there were 170,000 Christians in all the, all the land. But now, uh, it's less, less than that. And if you talk about Jerusalem, in, back in 1967, there were 30,000 indigenous Christians living in Jerusalem. Now it's 6,000 or less. Most of the Christians they are expat who come and go. And this is the main challenge for us, for the churches, how to preserve the living stones in the land. Because I think Christians is a very important part of the mosaic of that city, where there's Jewish, Christians, and Muslims living together there. And that's a challenge for us, how to keep this presence to be, to be, to be continued and to be strong. Second, the second concept of our mercy, God has called the communion to, co to commit to a ministry of reconciliation to help restore humanity and the way to God's intended purposes. Righteousness, justification, sanctification, and reconciliation are interlocking doctrines in God's messianic project to restore the beloved community. Reconciliation, as we understand, as, as we understand it, incorporates relationships between God and humans among humans and humans, and between humans and nature, which is very important. This year, every year, we, we meet as church council. The annual church council we usually meet in Amman, Jordan. We just finished our synod beginning of this uh, month, no, November, and we have met under the theme of the Ministry of Reconciliation, because we believe strongly that this is a duty and part of our faith. As we, as a human being, as a Christians, we've been reconciled through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's very important to our ministry. During times of conflict and hopelessness, a ministry of reconciliation provides God's injun injunction to enter, be, and interact with the world. As the Middle East, continues to seethe and suffer, we strive for openness, cooperation, moderation, tolerance, hospitality, and progress. As I sur survey our communities and institutions, I see a committed ministry of reconciliation, individuals and communities striving to build bridges, strengthening fellowships, and establish partnership with domestic, both domestic and international for soulful and social transformation towards greater justice and mercy. The communion is committed to ecumenical dialogue and joint undertakings with other faiths. Our commitment to unity in Jerusalem, for example, involves unity in practice where we engage with sister churches and faith for the common good of all God's family. We believe strongly in just peace building, and we constantly call upon both Israelis and Palestinians to find a mutual ground on which to pursue peace, justice, and human dignity. We are committed to interreligious engagement with the three Abrahamic faiths, 
urging all parties to cast off sectarianism, narrow nation nationalism, exceptionalism, and extremism in order to meet, embrace, and cherish the different other. Inspired by the Good Samaritan, we are committed to Jesus' message, go and do likewise. If I want to, to speak about the Ministry of Reconciliation and uh, how we, we wish Jerusalem, how to be Jerusalem, an open place for everybody. And you know, part of our Anglican uh, mission, uh, you are aware that the GAFCON, they came to Jerusalem in, in uh, this, the past June. And they came in a big number, around 2,000. And we know, you know their agenda, maybe to split from the Anglican Communion. But I, I sent a message to them that if you want to come to Jerusalem, you must know that Jerusalem is for uh, unity, not for division. And uh, I, I, welcome, I welcome them at the cathedral, St. George's Cathedral. And also I addressed them to feel that, uh, of course, of all uh, our differences, we are still the one body of Christ. So I hope and will continue to pray, to pray for this reconciliation, which is very important in the life of our Anglican communion. So the, the third concept, the communion is committed to the needs of victims of political circumstances and conflict. We pursue a ministry that suckers those directly and indirectly affected by failure to resolve the status of Palestine and failure to achieve peace and prosperity elsewhere in the Middle East. Schools, vocational centers, hospitals and clinics, homes for the elderly and community centers function throughout the communion to aid, to aid the needy people, the marginalized and the poor. Uh, it's good for you to know that as small as we are in number, but we run more than 30 institutions in the five countries. And uh, we run two general hospitals. There is one in Gaza, one in Nablus. We have five clinics. We have 14 schools. We have five rehabilitation centers. There's very one important one in Jerusalem, Princess Basma, a center for children rehabilitation. And I believe that this is our good work that we are carrying. This is our mission in, the, in, the, in, the, in our societies. Uh, these institutions who help those who are in need. So we don't differentiate. Because in Gaza, we don't have one Anglican there, but we have a hospital. And we serve the community there. And uh, God willing, we are preparing to start a cancer hospital in Gaza. It will be the first because they have, there is no treatment for cancer. People are really troubled through checkpoints and face difficulties and hardships to get to Jerusalem for treatment. Ho we hope and we pray that in one year's time or mostly two years, we have all the facilities to treat our people in Gaza in our hospital. So this is a challenge for me and for you. If you, if you can help us, this is great. <laughs> this is what I told the congressman yesterday. I know that they cut off the budget to help the, hosp or the hospitals in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, and uh, we are very much affected by this. Nevertheless, we can still go, go ahead, you know, with our vision to have these facilities in our hospitals. So our ministry as taking a clear stance with friends and critics alike. Human dignity needs to be respected, cherished, and embraced. Our Christian faith calls us, calls on us to handle our present 
with determination and deal with our future with optimism. We know that in Jerusalem, we always say that Jerusalem is, uh, is the city of the resurrection, is the city of hope. So regardless of what's going on, but we keep hope strong in the, in, in the hearts and minds of our people. And that's very important, especially young people. Because if you talk about the, the, the Christian communities that is shrinking, many young people, they leave. They don't stay in, in the land because they look for a better future outside, outside the region. If you, if you know about uh, the young people in general, every year uh, more than 35,000 young men and women graduate from local universities. You know how the percentage of the, uh, those who get jobs? Not more than 25% or 30%. This is very sad. So you go to the restaurant, you see uh, university students, they are working, even they are cleaning. And that's hard for young people and for their future. So this is part of the sad situation in which our young people, they live and experience. We want to make clear for ourselves what does being the Jerusalem Church mean for us? We want to understand better to be Christians in our churches with, with its privileges and its challenges and difficulties. We want to see how to contribute to the construction of our Anglican societies in Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Cyprus and the Gulf, Iran. We want to understand how, with all our fellow Christians, can we work for Christian unity, unity of heart, in spite of diversity and differences. We want to understand better how to build relationships with other religions, with Muslims and Jews, in a comprehensive vision of faith. You know that if I speak about interfa interfaith work, we with the Muslims, we, are, we, 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 we regard ourselves as one community because we speak the same language, we, uh, we share the culture, we share uh, uh, the suffering together. And uh, every year at St. George's Cathedral, I always uh, have iftar for our brothers, the Muslims, who come in big numbers with, our, with the Christians also friends. So it become very traditional every year to host iftar for the Muslims in Jerusalem and the West Bank. They come from all the West Bank. So this is really very important. And we have a good relationship with the Waqf in Al-Aqsa Mosque. So all our visitors and guests, we, they go there and visit by arrangement with the director of the Awqaf uh, in Jerusalem. And with the Jewish also, we share, we, have, we share the faith with the Jewish. So I believe that uh, we as Christians, I see our role as a bridge who are bringing communities together. And this is very important in, in, uh, in our ministry of reconciliation. So the communion, although representing a tiny number of people spread throughout an expensive, expansive, sorry, expansive region. <laughs> well, it's, sometimes it's expensive, yes. <laughs> uh, has offered great blessings to many people. We are proud of the individuals, individuals, groups, and institutions that form our community embodying the message of Christ. I know that Christians are so small in numbers in our region. But we strongly believe that Christians in the Middle East are not a minority in a way that our right to exist depends on the mercy of the bigger political powers or other religious institutions. Christians are empowered 
by God to live by his, by his reconciliation, empowered to reconcile others. As I said that there is a big role that we as Christians play in the land of the Holy One. We are a bridge and we can uh, make a difference there by our presence. We are practicing this, uh, uh, our dialogue, we are practicing this through our meetings, through our connections, through our schools, through our hospitals, through the work of these institutions. I know that in many ways, we have 7,000 students in our schools. And 70% of the students, they are Muslims. When I ask a Muslim parent, why you are sending your children to our school? He said for two things. First, you have good education. Our schools is really the best. And we believe in your values. So that's really good. And this is we share also with, other, with others there. Uh, when I go to Gaza to visit our hospitals, I really uh, I have some joy in my heart to see that this hospital is really uh, treating so, so many people, whether they are injuries or uh, sickness or whatever through. But it's good when I approach them, they recognize that. Because if you go to the hospital in Gaza, Ahli Arab Hospital, there is no indication that this is a Christian hospital. Nothing to indicate that it's a Christian hospital. But I believe strongly that the ministry inside is a Christian. And this is a Lord's ministry there in Gaza. And I, I have to say also, it's very much appreciated by the people of Gaza. So that's why we, it's a, a very dear institution as others that we feel we are a caring community. And that's very important for our presence. So when we, when we are talking about numbers, well, as I said that for sure, Christians are so small in numbers in the Middle East. But when it comes to the essential things in life, Numbers don't really count. When it comes to the essential things, the, the witness of one man, one woman, one child, reconciled and sanctified by God, is worth all of the power of the so-called majorities. And that's, that's very important. When we feel exhausted, we are, as Christians, reminded of the em empty tomb in Jerusalem. And we turn to our living and loving God for strength. We turn to our brothers and sisters around the globe for encouragement in times of struggle. Well, I have to mention here that we as a Diocese of Jerusalem have a very strong relationship with the Episcopal Church in America. So we have a strong partnership. Uh, many institutions, they got uh, contributions from America. We have American Friends of Jerusalem. Other, uh, we have other institutions. Uh, of course, you know, Archbishop uh, Michael Carey, he came for a visit to Jerusalem and uh, to Jordan, and he really spent good time in visiting institutions. I know this man, he is uh, really a man of God. When he came to, our, to the country, he said, I've, my preference is to visit institutions. He visited every hospital, every school, and it was really a very fruitful visit. And we really appreciate and value our partnership with the Episcopal Church here in America. Well, I, I would like also finally to say that we invite each and every one of you to come to learn about the communion in the Middle East. I recite John 1.46 and encourage you, as it is, to come and see. I am sure you will find living stones committed to the way of Christ. You will witness how our efforts are bringing change and new possibilities. You will find open hearts and busy hands. 
you will find faithful believers walking the talk, liberating souls, and transforming societies for greater justice and mercy. For you and for them, we thank God. May his loving heart bless us all. And thank you very much. My name is Robert Heaney. I am Associate Professor for Christian Mission and Director of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies here at Virginia Seminary. And I want to add uh, my word of welcome to that of Bishop Mathis and say that it's our delight and our honor and our privilege to welcome Archbishop Dewani here at Virginia Seminary. I want to thank him especially for his insightful and articulate words uh, this evening. The scriptural, uh, historical, interreligious converge on and emerge from the Holy Land in unique ways. In order for us to get to some of those issues, we have invited members of our own faculty to help us do some of that work this evening. Dr. Stephen L. Cook is the Catherine N. McBurney Professor of Old Testament Language and Literature. He is a widely published and widely respected leader in the academy and in the church. His most recent publication is a commentary on Ezekiel published in the Anchor Yale Bible series. As well as a writer of books, he is also known for his blogging presence and his innovative techniques in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hannah Mattis is professor of church history. She is a scholar particularly interested in medieval history and has just completed a book on the Song of Songs in the early Middle Ages. Her scholarship is wide ranging and of uncommon depth. As a gifted musician, she doesn't just write about songs, she also sings them. Dr. Zainab Zylgan is Professor of Islamic Theology and Religious Pluralism. Her research and upcoming book focus on the intersection of Islamic theology and immigration. Her skill as a scholar has been recognized by the Louisville Institute, and she is one of only five Louisville postdoctoral fellows. Herself a migrant, she delights in inviting and guiding seekers on pilgrimage to the beautiful land of Turkey. And as I myself have discovered, she knows where to find the best baklava. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, welcome your panel. Um, so this evening, as much as uh, is possible, we'd really like this to be a conversation between our panel, but also between you uh, as well in the audience. Um, when invited, please just raise your hand. Uh, we have microphones, wait for the microphone. Ask your question. The only plea is to keep your question on point and uh, succinct. And do not necessarily take me as your model when I start asking questions. <laughs> um, so let's begin then. Uh, I want to invite each of our panelists to reflect on Archbishop Dewani's address and ask um, an initial question. So the question is this. As you listen to Archbishop Dewani, what theme particularly struck you as important and what question are you left with? Uh, Hannah. Okay. Um, I was struck by the juxtaposition of past history and present mission of the Diocese of Jerusalem, and it's shaped by the presence of the British Empire at really interesting moments in the history of the Middle East. You know, your dates are 1841, 1957, 1976. Um, 
And yet, as you say, in your present ministry, you are vulnerable, you are outnumbered, and you are committed to service and reconciliation. Um, here in America, I think that many people here feel burdened, maybe even paralyzed, by the weight of their own history. Um, it sits on us very heavily, and that can get in the way of our ability to do mission and reconciliation. Um, would you have any advice for us in just thinking through our own history? Well, of course, you know, the, our history is completely different from uh, yeah. the land and here, where our, our land passes through so many wars yeah. and crises. And every crisis affects the life of people and their spirituality. And uh, that's really difficult. Well, here you are in a very relaxed country. So you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> but uh, although, although we have difficulties and crises, but we are a people who are really thankful yeah. to God yeah. for everything. So this is really uh, a miracle or as I said that, hope. For, and hope, that's very important. So, and also here, you can, you can learn from our people there, because this is, you know, a culture that can exchange, you know, uh, experiences. So we learn from you, and you learn from us. Zainab, what did you hear, and what question are you left with? Well, first, thank you very much, I really, um I uh, appreciate um, what you shared about your Ministry of Reconciliation in a very intense climate that I can barely imagine. Um, and uh, what I really value that you alluded to, the connection between the local and the global, that there is a global rise of exceptionalism, exclusivism, all these social sicknesses we experience right now around the globe. I mean, if you look at Europe, if you look at the United States, and I'm wondering, what are some of the resources you could share with us um, to do that type of work of reconciliation in our local context, like really calling each of us individually? Because sometimes you look at the world out there, the global context, and feel like, oh, we are just so helpless. We can't do much here in our local context. And I am a strong believer that there is a deep connection between the global climate and, the, I mean, the, how the local climate affects the global climate. And we live in a time, in a critical time, where we see this is not something peculiar to the Holy Land, this type of extremism, exclusivism, or the excessive nationalism. But that's really a global sickness. And how can we do, each of us can do that work here? And the global climate is really affecting us. We have to go back. Uh, not to a long history, but to 1990, mm -hmm. with the invasion of Iraq. And that one, uh, things started deteriorating in the Middle East. And since that time, also extremism started to rise because of this. And uh, as, as locals, I know that uh, we don't su uh, suffer uh, any kind of extremism among our, in our, in our uh, societies and cultures, but it's all important. Mm. And sometimes it's uh, using it as to target our coexistence. But uh, I, I, I thank God that we really maintain a good relationship among all, especially between Christian and Muslims in our, in our country, in our region. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. And there is, no, there is no place for extremism. I know that there is uh, some groups, or, right. but I think our people are aware and uh, they always react positively toward bringing about you know, good relationship with everybody. Uh, nevertheless, on a daily basis, we have to, to, you know, to, uh, we have to fight against those who come from outside and uh, 
So this, this is really a, a problem for, for us and for our existence. Mm -hmm. So we have to take away extremism, which really, uh, as I said, they're growing in number, and they are the tools. Uh, politically, they've been used for, you know, to serve so many uh, politics of bad politics, you know, in, in this world. I'm mm -hmm. sorry to say this. Stephen. Mm. Welcome. I, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for, for being here and for sending us your students. Some of my favorite students over the 20 plus years I've taught here have been sent from Jerusalem and the, and the Middle East. I'm thinking of Hossam, Naum, and Ferris Naum, and Halim Shukair, the Wadi Wadiya. Nadia. <laughs> um, these are people who, br who bring to the classroom, um, the real experience of being in the land of the Bible, which um, they can talk about places that many of our students just read about and they have a passion for communicating what it's like to, to live there. And I just want to thank you for your sending the students and your support of us. And I think the things that you value about our seminary are the things that I value, the, the solid curriculum, the, the emphasis on biblical studies, and these, these are things, quite frankly, that um, are very much up in the air. We're in a time of great turmoil and um, great uh, de uh, demoralization about some of these issues right now. So thank you just for being here and for supporting all of that. Um, I think one of the things that I really noticed and loved about the talk was several times you mentioned that uh, Jesus wasn't just he was certainly, certainly concerned about humanitarian and political mm -hmm. issues, but he was on a, a larger project than just addressing the immediate situation of oppression. And you used the word messianism more than, mm -hmm. than once, which I think conjures the notion that God is about a huge project of moving history um, and all peoples towards mutuality, community, living for the other rather than than the self. That must be a hard message to communicate to people who are in the midst of immediate conflict where they are hurting mm -hmm. um, and they have immediate issues. You mentioned several, crossing um, intolerable borders, mm -hmm. dealing with cancer that can't be treated locally. How do you suggest that the picture is wider, that, that what God is doing is more spiritual and more encompassing and more global than just the, the immediate day-to-day -day project of not getting killed? Well, I have to start from uh, talking about the religions because maybe this is the only place in the world that Jerusalem is a place for three Abrahamic faiths who live side by side. But we always believe that Religion must be part of the solution of the, of the problem. But unfortunately that people are misusing religion nowadays. Religion must they always seek the goodwill of all people and uh, must work for you know, reconciliation and also for dignity, human dignity. Bec and also for you know, respecting the, diff the different other in our communities. So religion should and must play a very important role in the lives of people there. Uh, we, are, we are fortunate to, to live together, but sometimes we can feel that the tension of uh, coming together as uh, uh, three Abrahamic faiths. I know that we have a very strong interfaith uh, you know, dealings and meetings and committees, but we are not, no more progressing, you know, because uh, polit uh, politics are also dictate itself on, on our work. On the, so we hope, and uh, as I said, that we will continue working with others uh, for, for the, we cannot solve all the problems there, because it's beyond our capabilities, but at least we can do our our part, you know, in 
in uh, serving the community and bringing people together. This is what we do in, in our schools and our institutions. And, and that's really uh, the hope that we carry in our hearts and minds. I want to give you uh, an opportunity to come in. If I see a hand or two, I will pause. I see two hands. Let's, if you just wait to get uh, a microphone right at the top right, and then uh, Daniel here in the, in the, in the middle. Yes, I was, I was wondering, uh, there are, I, I know if I was there in 2016, we, we had a, with Father uh, Canon John Peterson, one of his tours, and uh, it was interesting, there are religious Jews and there are non-religious Jews, and um, I was wondering in the other faiths involved, is the percentage of people who are truly religious, uh, how, where does, where do the different, the different religions come in there where people who are truly religious versus the people who are not percentage wise of that of each population do you have a feel for that or if it's growing or shrinking or what's happening there mm. Archbishop let's take two together and then we'll, okay. we'll, we'll comment Daniel do you have a, a mic this one's uh, quite different um, the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, is uh, making some reforms which seem to be liberalizing some of the very strict religious um, <clears throat> behavior codes there um, and some of those are regarded differently by different people. I'm wondering if any of that um, makes it easier to be Christian in the Middle East. I assume it doesn't make it any easier in Saudi Arabia. That certainly has not changed. But does that <clears throat> liberalizing of some of the Islamic codes by uh, Saudi Arabia uh, send a signal uh, that is um, that leads to some liberalization of the way mm -hmm. Christians can be in the Middle East. Okay. Thank you. And I think I, I have to bring Zainab in in this one as well. <laughs> um, so let's start with the question. This is not a word you used, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to use it because I hope, hope it captures it. Nominalism. Um, and so the question is asked, you ma made a distinction between secular Jews and religious Jews. Is there a sense in which that is a reality in other faith traditions, and particularly uh, Christianity? Well, Christianity, we are small in number. And uh, I cannot describe that we have secular Christians, because they are all Christians. When it, when it, uh, if you talk about the Jewish people, they, of course they are secular but uh, they are maybe 30% of the population, and the 70 they are uh, religious. But the Christians, uh, because we are few thousands, and uh, because of the pressures they feel, so they become more committed to the church. And, uh, and in many ways, they, they come to the church, because their church for them is their mother and refuge in the time of difficulties and hardships. For the Muslims, I can say that, I, I, I can see that they have secular Muslims because they are committed as well. So this is you know, the situation in which we live in. And Saudi Arabia, so... Well, I think I'm going to invite Zainab, first of all. <laughs> this, Zainab, is, this is a very political one. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Let's get into yeah. the talk. You're, go <laughs> <laughs> You're going to thank me for inviting you tonight. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Crown Prince, and of course we're visiting terms on what's going on here, liberalism, reform. Can you comment on what you see as happening and what signal it's sending to the wider region? I think here in this country, we are very much focused on Saudi Arabia. We think it's the example par excellence for Islam and Muslims. But I think I would, I think that the Archbishop would join me in saying that for many Muslims around the world, actually what is the example is the relationship, uh, the positive relationship in the Holy Land between Christians and Muslims because they have been flourishing 
together for centuries. Um, and I think we need to be cautious here because in the media or generally we get this impression that Saudi Arabia really presents a normativity or the standard um, uh, mainstream Islamic branch, which actually it, it doesn't. And it, in fact, for many Muslims around the world, if you look at statistics and surveys, uh, Saudi Arabia, which is a very modern state, has a very narrow and um, uh, you know narrow, narrow approach to certain things when it comes to uh, em embracing religious diversity, em engaging with um, uh, people of other faiths. So. I welcome the move. I mean, it's great, and Muslims around the world uh, appreciate that there has been, you know, certain reforms launched and that help, uh, you know, could inspire other um, groups around the world to reconsider certain ideas. Uh, but I, again, I would flag that Saudi Arabia uh, is um, not really normative or the the model state Islam for Muslims around the world. In fact, they're very critical of Saudi Arabia because of certain things that they feel are not within mainstream Islam, within um, orthodoxy. And um, so I think that's really important. And I'm glad that Archbishop Adawani really uh, stressed the importance that we need to widen our perspective. We always think of the Judeo-Christian heritage, the so Judeo-Christian context in Europe, but he really focuses on weight. In the Holy Land, the Near Eastern kingship includes Muslims as well since, you know, centuries. And we need to include in the scriptural heritage, include in this wider conversation, Jews, Christians, and Muslims together and not think the Muslim is the other, the Quran is the other scripture, but it's really in, you know, there's this deep seated dialogue that this has been taking place for centuries. So I would say that this Near Eastern kingship or this uh, kingship in the Holy Land is really modeling for Muslims and they have always looked up to this. Look, um, you know, Muslims have always lived together with Christians. And what's happening today with the marginalization of Christians or Jews in certain countries or the decreasing number is really a modern phenomenon of fundamentalism, extremism, because in pre-modern times, we see that communities have flourished under, uh, you know, moderate leadership and uh, orthodox uh, Islamic understandings. The appeal to history is a great place to bring uh, Hannah in again. Um, and this is a chance, I think, Your Grace, that you, you can ask some questions too. Um, <laughs> so Archbishop Dewani Hannah sketched the modern history of the Christian presence uh, in uh, the Holy Land. He pointed to the complexities of that history and the complexities of the ongoing situation in the Holy Land. So as a historian, um, what historical m moments or reading principles um, should US citizens keep in mind as they read the history of the Holy Land? Sm small question. <laughs> Um, so if you don't mind, I mean, I feel like I should talk to um, the, the, the room, I suppose, if what mm -hmm. we are thinking about is what, what is on us. Um, I think as Westerners, I'll begin with the reading principles question, because in my head, the reading principles shapes which historical moments are particularly important. Um, as Westerners, we very often come to the Holy Land, not as natives, but as tourists, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and that includes pilgrimage um, as well, unfortunately. And that, that means we come with our own baggage, both literal and mental. Um, we come with our own languages. We usually do not speak Arabic. We come with our own history. Sometimes these are European. Sometimes these are from elsewhere. Um, because these places and these names mean so much to us, you know, half of our towns in America are named after places in the Old Testament, and yet, so what that means is that we have this tendency to take our own topography, our own map, and project it onto the Holy Land um, and to what we value onto the landscape of the Holy Land. Um, to some extent, I don't think we can help that. We value what we value. But the danger is, is that I think sometimes, particularly we as Americans, literally do not see 
or do not recognize our own fellow Christians when they are in front of us, um, particularly when they are speaking Arabic. Um, they can be Palestinian, they can be Orthodox, they can be Coptic, they can be Syriac speaking, they can be Persian speaking, they can be any one of a host of Christian minorities in the Middle East, and to, particularly to American Protestants, they are invisible. Um, and so that, that is something that is on us, to educate ourselves. Um, and there is a long history in the West of treating the Middle East as exotic and timeless. And you know, the, the theoretical word would be we orientalize it, um, to use the phrase of, of a Palestinian scholar, Edward Said. So we fit the Middle East into a pattern in the narrative that we carry around in our heads. Um, so if you think Disney's Aladdin, that, that world. Um, and that pattern has connotations uh, in which we visit and exploit the Middle East for our own ends. And that's very dangerous because that puts us in a position of power that allows us to transpose our reality and our narrative instead of actually getting to know what is going on on the ground. Um, so as Westerners, I feel like we need to be very self-aware about our own biases and our own lenses and very honest with ourselves about why we are interested and what we are doing there. Um, and the onus on us is to try to set, insofar as we can, set those biases aside and try to understand this very, very complicated history um, and these very complicated communities on their own terms and not on ours. Um, so that's the reading principle. Um, historical moments. Um, Given that that is our problem, <laughs> or at least I feel that that is our problem, I would suggest a sort of Goldilocks approach where we focus on the ancient past long enough to be aware and to understand what is going on, but not at the expense of forgetting that the world that we see in the, in the Middle East is so much, and, and you were already saying this, Your Grace, you know, is a product of modern forces. Um, we have a tendency to think of conflict in the Middle East as being something sort of immemorial from the time of Jacob and Esau. And it means that we think that ferocious retributive fighting is something that has been going on for forever. And this is sort of what Zainab was saying. Um, that conveniently blinds us to the extent to which modern Western liberal democracies are responsible for a great deal of stoking ethnic conflict and hostility all of the time. Um, so that, again, that onus is on us to be aware of what our role is over there and to be aware of how many of those problems have their roots in modern questions, modern concerns. So um, I say we begin in part by studying the modern Middle East, by studying the legacy of the Ottoman Empire, by studying the world wars, and by studying the situation of a post-imperial Middle East and what it means as it tries to navigate itself toward a greater degree of self-determination. Um, but I'm also a medieval historian. Um, so I would also suggest that um, we take a look at the Crusades, uh, because that is a classic case of Westerners imposing their own narratives and their own values on a Middle Eastern situation, trying to recapture what was to them the center of the universe. But while they did it, they didn't recognize that the people who were most vulnerable, who were caught between Frankish knights and Seljuk Turks, uh, Seljuk Muslims were the Arabic-speaking Christians, the Greek-speaking Christians. Um, they were the people of the Pentecost. And mm. the Frankish Christian knights like, literally did not see their co-religionists when they were in front of their faces. Um, and so as I say, that's, I'll sort of begin where I end then, um, or end where I begin. And so that is our problem, seeing our, uh, our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Mm. Thank you. Stephen, a similar kind of um, question of hermeneutics arises um, when it comes to approaching the biblical text. Um, the complexities, the politics, and the violence at work, even just this week in the Holy Land, make any facile reading of the text quite literally dangerous. Um, how are Christians to understand the call and vocation of Israel in the Hebrew Bible? And how can that resource uh, what the Archbishop calls a ministry of hope, love, dignity, neighborliness? Thank you, Robert. Another small question. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> Seems to 
often fall on me to turn the, turn the conversation theological, uh, try to push back. This is a seminary. Let's talk about interpreting the Bible and what, what, what God is doing. So I think in some ways our situation here at Virginia Seminary is not that, that different. We've got a huge problem with Marcionism, with people being uncomfortable with the Old Testament. And it's a, it's a cause of great um, demoralization here at, at the seminary. You have a situation where um, people rightly worry that the First Testament, the, uh, the uh, Older Testament, um, can be used by folks to, to claim rights to the Holy Land. I think that's a hermeneutically invalid use <laughs> of the text, but you have folks in your, in your parishes across, across all of your jurisdiction that are uncomfortable with, with the Hebrew Bible because it can be used wrongly. Um, and so I, I'm just sensitive to the position that you're in um, because obviously Christianity is, is a, a scripture that was born and nourished primarily out of the Older Testament. Jesus, Paul, they had no other Bible but the, the First Testament, the Prime, the prime Testament. Um, and even though we're facing the loss of, of the First Testament, we, we can't let that happen because the, the Second Testament will come right right on its heels and we'll lose that as well because the two the New Testament can't stand on its own. It would be like a a, a head without a torso. It's so much so often brings us back to the earlier scriptures to clarify, to flesh out, to deepen the the statements that are being made by Jesus, by Paul, by the other other texts. Um, so just just the situation that you're wrestling with is 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 precarious and difficult and hard to to talk about. But I will say, I enjoyed your sermon this morning. I don't know if any of you were there, but um, to a packed chapel, he uh, he spoke about the the ten lepers in Luke 17, and that's just a um, it's a wonderful wonderful text because it illustrates your point about Jesus reaching across walls across boundaries. Um, Later on, he, uh, he reaches out to the Samaritan woman, as you mentioned. It, even in that text in Luke 17, 14 to 19, one of the lepers that he heals is a Samaritan. So he brings healing um, in an inclusive and embracing manner. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's really awesome. But then there's this whole issue of the, of the leprosy itself, that Jesus uh, is that Luke is careful to say that they kept their distance initially. You have to know the rules about leprosy back in Leviticus 13 to know why that's the case. And then Jesus specifically commands them that once, they're, once they leave, they're, they're to go to see the priest and get, um, get this checked out and authenticated. So he's commanding these folks to, to keep the, the laws of Leviticus, even though he's liberating them and, and, and saving them. He, and then, you know, beyond just that, there's this whole notion that, well, what does it mean that he's so concerned about the leprosy? You've got to know the whole theology surrounding um, what the Germans call Düsternis, what um, we, we might call Merck, <laughs> this notion that beyond just the political crisis and, and the crisis of people hurting and needing physical healing, there is this um, spirit of uncleanness and um, chaos in the world that Jesus is here respecting and confronting so that it's a spiritual and a messianic issue. We have to start talking about theology, not just the political consciousness and the rescue of the, uh, the hurting and the sick. So in order to do all of that theological and spiritual work, you've got to abandon the Marcionism and read the two testaments in dialogue so that the Old Testament's fleshing out and expanding what's going on in this encounter with the 10, with the ten lepers. And then there's the further complication. I mean, this is what biblical scholars do. We, we problematize and complexify and <laughs> keep digging deeper until we bring up all the problems that we can. So, Luke is not 
univocal about the Samaritans. Uh, we reach out to them, but at, at, at another point, um, way back in chapter 9, verses 52 to 56, Jesus is trying to, to minister to the Samaritans, but they don't want anything to do with him. They don't accept him or want to hear anything from him because he's focused on Jerusalem and the political ramifications of that don't allow them to at least publicly um, navigate that conversation. It's just not possible politically. So the politics stands in the way of the spiritual. Um, I'm sure you face that every day of your, of your life, that the politics is standing in the way of the spiritual, even within the Christian community. Um, so again, my, my question is, how, how do you stay so calm? And <laughs> how are you so, you're so uh, centered and um, non-anxious? Uh, how do you, you know, I, I, get, I get all red-faced and worked up about, about these things. How do you do it? Well, uh, our people, they get used to difficulties and hardships because it becomes part of their life. It becomes like a routine of their life. So that, that's why they endure all these things, difficulties. When you see people crossing from Gaza to Israel and whether for treatment or visiting uh, relatives, it's hard for them. But it becomes part of their life. And uh, so suffering is something that is now, I cannot say that acceptable, but this is the reality now in which they live. And the question is how we can uh, relieve them from these sufferings and hardships. And this is, take, uh, takes us also to questions of the dignity of human beings. We always believe that every human being is created in the image and likeness of God, whether a Jew, a Muslim, or a Christian. Uh, so this is, this is the role and, uh, of religions. They should work on this, you know. If we believe in the God who is merciful and, uh, and uh, love and kind, so this is very important, very basics for us. So that's why we are struggling with so many things. But uh, when people ask me, what shall we pray for you? I always say for, uh, for, for patience, for uh, courage, and wisdom. And by the way, wisdom is very important to deal with so many issues there. Mm. I'm going to invite people in the audience to jump in, but I want to give Stephen and Hannah a heads up because I'm going to come back to you and ask, okay, given your advice to read history in a particular way, have the theological dialogue between the two testaments, okay, so I walk out of here tonight, where am I going to turn to to find something accessible that will put me on the road to doing those things? A book? Uh, a website? A movie? I don't know. Think about... Think about where you would send me, okay? But I'm going to go to the audience to give you um, a little, little bit of time because when I'm asked that question, um, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, um, yeah, um, hands that are up. Okay, right. Yeah, let's. Okay, thanks again to all of you. Um, this question might be as much for Dr. Heaney as for anyone else, but uh, you mentioned your grace um, multiple times, the small numbers of Christians in the Holy Land. Um, I gather that you would like that number to be larger. Uh, if so, where geographically and religiously do you envision those people coming from? Mm. So your grace, the question is numerical growth for mm. Christians in the Holy Land. Do you have hope for that? And if you do, where, where will those people come from? Who will they be? Well, at least to preserve the, the indigenous, indigenous people to stay, especially young people. If we can stop uh, young people from leaving the country, this is a first step forward that would help us to increase the population. If you go to some churches, you can hardly see any young people or children in the church. I know that Mr. Abrasal, he comes to Jerusalem every now and then, and being in the, ch the cathedral, 
How many children do you see? Oh, yeah. None. In other, in other places in the West Bank, we have growing communities. You can see so many children, young people, and this is a very optimistic, uh, you know. Uh, for me, it's very optimistic to, to have them. Well, I wish that someday, someday, so some families who left, because some families, they like to come back. But we should give them the opportunities and the welcome. In this political context now, and uh, it's not easy, because even sometimes to bring people from one area with the same region, from one area to another, is that difficult. Even mixed marriages is difficult between the West Bank and Israel. So, but this is really something for the future. If we can uh, encourage some families to come back, because some, some of them, even those who live maybe here in, the, in America or uh, in the Gulf or anywhere, someday they said that we, would, we wish to go back to our homeland. What about you? Maybe you, you will answer this, because he's from Nazareth. Please, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I am from Nazareth, the son of Mary, which is true, was born in December. <laughs> I, I was a member of Christ Church, the Anglican Church in Nazareth, so he's our respected, beloved bishop. And I came to study in the U.S. and taught at universities in Oklahoma and Florida and then retired, and my lovely wife, uh, who was born in Lebanon, but her mother is from Jerusalem and her father from Nazareth. So we decided to move our household from Gainesville, Florida, to Nazareth. So now we have a house in Nazareth and a house in Arlington, Virginia, and we commute between both of them. We spend about half the time in Nazareth and half the time in uh, Arlington, Virginia here. So uh, I'm kind of a dual mm. citizen. And uh, what else so, would you like for me to say? So the, really the hopes of, but it's politically unfeasible, of lots of people to return to the Middle East, to their homes, to Jerusalem, to, uh, you know, all Haifa, to everywhere. That, that's really the, what everybody would like to do, but it's not possible. It's a dream. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah just uh, to add on this, I think what you, um, you know, looking at immigration and mobility in these times, I think um, what will happen with the younger generation, what I see happening, just from my own experiences, that we will have um, transnational identities develop, that people feel, you know, that they belong to multiple countries and multiple cultures. And while I think, um, you know, you have a certain um, rootedness, at the same time you feel through studies and moving that you develop this relationship with multiple contexts. And I think that's also where, um, uh, you know, Christian growth in countries like Saudi Arabia, like in the Gulf countries, that will definitely grow over, you know, o o over the coming years. And that's why it's so critical to <clears throat> establish a framework where Christian communities and other religious communities can flourish, um, can practice religious, their religious freedom and, and their worship. But I think that's what's exactly happening. It's happening already in your generation, but now with you know, all, you know, people migrating, moving, studying, they don't feel that they just fit in one box, but they feel belonging to all these contexts. Three, I mean, I'm from Germany, I have Turkey, and I spent my summers in multiple contexts, and I don't want to decide, oh, am I this, am I that? I feel that there is a little world within me, and, and I think that's also an opportunity which should not be dismissed. There's also a, a, another development here, which I think is very promising. Okay, our time is running short, but I want to get back to the resources question. Uh, Stephen and Hannah, um, wh where would you point someone that they could begin to do some of this work in their, in their, in their own lives? 
Yeah, there's, there's excellent um, resources. I, I think a, a great place to start healing, hermeneutic <laughs> healing, if you will, interpreting the Bible spiritually and, and theologically, would be to um, read the New Testament through, say, uh, there's a new book that was published a few years ago. It's called The Jewish Annotated New Testament, edited by Amy Jill Levine and um, Mark Brettler. Mark teaches down at Duke now. Um, Amy Jill is a world-class Jewish scholar of the New Testament. Um, these are just excellent research, resources for, and there's a famous rabbi who said decades ago that he never understood the New Testament until he read it in Hebrew. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's very illuminating. Um, another good one is the, is the complete Jewish study Bible, especially the New Testament portion edited by David Stern. Um, I think just the, the re reconciling between Jews um, and uh, Christian Arabs would, would really be helped by resourcing these, these books. And let me just do something a little, little brash and, and just controversial. We've got Jim, the, 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 the president of the, uh, of the St. George's College uh, American support group here. Jim, I would challenge you to, to go to your board and ask them to, ch to see if the college would change the name of this course that they've taught for decades about um, the Palestine of Jesus. I'll consult with the archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I think Palestine is an anachronism and it's theologically mis misleading and it's not hermeneutically. <laughs> well, I mean, if we're going to talk about the current land, yeah. it's perfectly fine to talk about Israel, Palestine. Mm. Um, I just, uh, I, I worry, I worry about, and I'm not saying that anyone does this, but other people in the Middle East, including prominent people, talk about. Jesus as a Palestinian martyr, um, which I think has some truth to it, but it misses this whole theological and hermeneutical conversation <laughs> that I'm talking about. And it makes it political. It, you're leaving out the theological and the spiritual, and it just becomes a political question. Mm -hmm. Maybe just pilgrimage with Jesus would work. Uh, that works for me. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get that. Thank you, Dr. Cook. <laughs> Sounds like a I'm question over, yes, over a glass of wine um, and reception. We prefer to keep it uh, Palestine and Jesus, or Jesus and Palestine, which is, I think, this is the proper name for that. And it has connotation of the land. The land is very important. Mm. And Jesus was the son of that land. Mm. And uh, he is, his whole mission is about uh, people and the... The, you know, the, the, and he concerns about those who are unprivileged, as I said in my sermon this morning, mm. and we continue to follow his steps, you know. Mm. So whatever the name is used, a reference to the geography, to the actual land, is central. So we may have to come up with another option. Hannah, resources. Oh, my. Um, so I am frantically searching because... Surprisingly enough, I, I actually think, I mean, I remember when I, I was working in a, uh, in a bookstore, I've told Zen of this, I was working in a bookstore, a big chain bookstore um, at the time when I was in college when uh, September 11th happened. And I think we maybe had one book of Bernard Lewis like tucked in the back of the store and all of a sudden everybody wanted to learn about Islam and there was like nothing we could give people. Um, I, I hope the resources are slightly better than they were, but learning about modern Middle Eastern history is, is a sort of, is a deep, um, is a deep well. Uh, learning about the Crusades is not much, is uh, not much easier. Um, but I would recommend, you know, if you're thinking about the sort of the history, the sort of complicated relationship, um, you know, if you look at um, uh, histories of Christianity that have a global perspective, um, so one of the sources that I assign um, my students here is uh, Robert Wilkins' um, History of Christianity called the First Thousand Years which um, deliberately looks at the roots of Christianity as a global phenomenon. 
um, uh, which is always very important. Um, I don't know if you guys are fans of uh, Dermot McAuliffe, but his one volume, History of Christianity, tries to do so as well. Um, the more you see your faith as coming from this very complicated place, um, you know, the work of a historian like Peter Brown um, will compare, you know, compare and contrast um, many of these, uh, these issues, you know, comparing Orthodox Christianity with Syrian or Syriac speaking Christianity and, and just really holding these things in tension. Um, if you're just curious about many of these things, there's actually been a wonderful, um, I think, growth in film. If you guys are interested in these kinds of things, um, I think it helps. Often you were talking about language and the role of language. And I think as Westerners, it helps us to hear language spoken and to see ourselves in the private lives um, and then in the lives of people, it helps us to recognize. I personally really love the film, A Waltz with Bashir. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this film, but it's, it's an animated film. It's intensely moving. I really would recommend it. Um, I also really love the film Lemon Tree. If any of you have ever seen Lemon Tree, um, Haim Abbas is, is, is wonderful. Um, um, and there is, uh, there's another film recently, um, and I am, I'm trying to remember. I was, I was trying to find the actual title of it. Um, uh, but if you look for uh, what Haim Abbas has been in, um, she was recently in a film that's about Syrian refugees in this country, and it deliberately addresses this problem of not being seen. Um, and it's called The Visitor. That's what it's called. It's called The Visitor. Uh, and it's a wonderful film about, again, the problem of being a, a Syrian refugee and being in this country and and just sometimes our our lack of vision on these things. Mm. Uh, if, if you are Please. familiar with the great courses, the, there is a, oh, yes, a, absolutely. A, a about, oh. about the Holy Land Reveal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember who teaches that? And Dermot McCullough's book was made into a TV series as well, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It's him in a, him in a, in a, in a uh, white Panama hat um, That's right. bouncing around That's the, right. <laughs> the Middle East. Oh, yes, really? it does. Uh, okay. So we definitely are out of time, um, I, but I do want to give Archbishop Dewani the final word as you've reflected on um, what you've heard uh, this evening. Um, uh, are there final words uh, that you'd like to leave us with this evening? What I would like to say that thank you very much for having interest in, in the land of the Holy One. And as I said in my speech, uh, come and see. I believe that uh, the Christian community is a forgotten community, especially by the Western countries. They don't care about the faith of this community. We are not on their agenda. But it's very important, as, as I said, to keep the mosaic of that region, in which there are Jewish, Christian, and Muslims living together. And we must keep that. It will be a model for the whole world, how they live together. This is my prayer and my vision. So come and see. So um, as we close, um, I would like to just take a moment to say a few words of thanks and invite you to some refreshments uh, with uh, the Archbishop and with our panelists. The reception is downstairs. Uh, staff and kindly people will direct you. We're going to go down uh, to the lower level um, for refreshments and further conversation. When Virginia Seminary Center for Anglican Communion Studies decided to have a a program year on the communion in the Middle East, we knew we must have the primate of the Anglican province of Jerusalem and the Middle East to speak to us and to launch the year. So we were absolutely thrilled uh, that Archbishop Duani made time for us in a very busy and demanding schedule. Your grace, uh, we are moved and inspired by your sermon this morning and tonight by the conversation Thank you for being with us and for uh, sharing with us so generously. To the panelists, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Cook, Dr. Mattis, Dr. Seiligan, thank you for your ongoing commitment uh, to learning, understanding, to life-giving dialogue. Uh, that vision was very much in evidence 
in our conversation this evening. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, your keynote speaker and your panelists. I'm one I'm wondering